Let's talk about let's talk about something that I don't want to talk about, but I have to talk about it because it happened. Um, Man United lost yesterday night to Barcelona three 0 at the Camp Nou, ended the aggregate score at four 0 I'm going to be completely honest and tell you that I didn't watch the game after the second goal. I turned it off. I was like, you know what, that's done. There's no way we're going to come back from this. And I think most United fans were very honest with themselves and would expect the same sort of thing, right? Like we're not going to come back from this. It's not happening. And um. I guess the, you, you, let's put the game to one side. I don't really care about talking about the game because, you know, essentially we lost because, you know, individual error because we have poor players. We lost because of a goalkeeping error because our goalkeeper was having a bit of a mad this season. And we lost because our front line, especially our strikers, are not clinical enough at this level to really uh, take us to the next level. Simple as that, right? Cool. So um, the problems that we have at United are quite broad and very deep and will require... A, a, um, a real ruthless edge to him, right? A real ruthless kind of summer. Because essentially what we have, I think someone mentioned it with the back four, we have four players that were playing in defence that played in 2011 when we played FC Basel and we got spanked, right? And usually in most European clubs or in most European clubs, whenever you get spanked in the Champions League um, by a lesser known team, you, it's usually the sign that that team that you put out needs to be revamped, right? You need to ha- buy new players. You need to get rid of the ones that are there already. Like, that's the sign of it. It's sort of like similar when um when a team, especially a host nation or, you know, a team that's ver- that's going to be, that's tipped as being the favourites in the World Cup or in the Euros, goes out in one of the early rounds. Everyone pays a price. The manager immediately gets sacked or has to walk. The players that were instrumental in that team might get turned over. They might promote some youngsters. Like, everyone's to blame because they can't afford to wait around to people to get better because Euros only comes around, what, every two years? Uh, World Cups every four years? There's not enough time for you to just wait around for that thing to happen, for that team to get better. And the European football is sort of heading in the same direction because essentially most of the big clubs are getting richer. Most of the clubs that are just below the big clubs are also getting richer. And the money from the TV rights, the streaming, to whatever it may be, is just pouring into football clubs. Pouring in, like essentially pouring in. Um, You could even look at stuff like fan channels. Fan channels have effectively created a new uh, media, um, quote, uh, hash media, quote unquote, revenue stream for most clubs, right? Uh, Some clubs that didn't have a media um, angle or weren't really concentrating on getting stuff out on the internet or getting our stuff on social, just by having a, I'd imagine if, imagine someone set up a fan channel for Clapton, right? The team around the corner. What would essentially happen there was that the Clapton football camera might see, oh shit, this guy's doing all this work anyway. Why don't we just hire him as a freelancer, get him on a retainer and just get him to do it anyway for us on our basis. Then we don't have to do anything because he's already got all the equipment, he can upload it. Cool. Then what does that do? That then increases the reach of Clapton FC on social media. People start talking about it. You end up uh, bringing in a revenue stream for the people that you're talking to on the channel. They end up getting a bit of popularity. They end up being the next, I don't know, the Captain DT, the Captain version of DT or something like that from AF- AFTV. And it continues. And then that's the media arm gets stronger. The club gets a more, more revenue through the eyes that are coming to the stadium. Blah, 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 blah. Cyclical, right? So essentially all clubs are getting rich. Um... And when all clubs get rich, the stakes are a lot higher because if a club gets relegated, that money dwindles. If a club misses out on winning a particular trophy, money goes. If this club doesn't finish a particular place on the table, money goes. If the club doesn't progress in a certain round of Champions League, money goes. It's all, 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 all very, very cutthroat. But I think United have been quite lucky in recent years where we've kind of got away with murder right we've kind of been able to spend obscene amount of money on players that probably shouldn't be on the money they're in they're on sorry for instance um i think i heard that marcus rojo is on more money than harry kane right and again tottenham tottenham's pay structure is a lot more rigid and a lot more and a lot more professional and maybe a lot more um with a future in mind than united's are right we know uh what's his name uh, the the I forgot his name is Casey, but the, the, the Tottenham's chairman doesn't fuck around, right? He takes business very seriously. So to hear that Marcus Rojo is a lot more money than Harry Kane, a player that you know essentially people would be happy to pay a hundred million plus for, a player that most clubs would be happy to give him two hundred grand a week as a minimum to have in a week. So to have somebody like uh, Marcus Rojo who's eternally injured, eternally inconsistent, not very not not a very good defender to earn that kind of man, much money is fucking ridiculous. So you've got that issue. You've got players that are subpar on big money. Then you've got the players that are talented, the ones that we buy who are like big ticket players who kind of in essentially have to rely a lot on the players around them. If they don't have a good team around them, they're going to be shit. For instance, Martial. If you put Martial in Juventus, he's going to score 20 goals a season. You just know it, right? He needs a good team to play. They don't... 
I don't think I was thinking the other day they don't make players like Steven Gerrard, like Lampard, like Paul Scholes, like Roy Keane, like Vieira. They don't make those players anymore. They don't exist in this current day and age. I don't sure what it is, but they don't exist. Those players that can drag a whole team through. Like um like a hazard, for instance. Hazard has probably done it in spurts and in spits and spans, right? It's it's all the short bursts. He doesn't really do it consistently. But Hazard, for instance, like if Chelsea did don't have Hazard, where would they be in the league, right? You have to kind of always think about that sort of because he's he has literally saved them um or got them results just for his own individual brilliance. But we don't necessarily have those players anymore. We have players nowadays who have to be in a good team to play well. Like there's there's no doubt in my mind if Neymar plays for Man United, he'd be horrible. Right? Because he can't do it on his own. He needs good players around him. They need to have the good players. Like if you mentioned, if you put Marshall, Pogba, uh, Fred, these kind of players in Barcelona, they'd shine, right? They look amazing because you need good players around. You need players that are going to play into your strengths. Same like with the players in Man City. A lot of those players like Gundogan, you put them in Wolves, you put them in, I don't know, Everton, you put them in teams that are a little bit maybe dysfunctional where the, play, the style of play doesn't really suit them. You won't see the best out of them. So we've wasted a lot of money on players who don't necessarily have that main identity of being able to drag a team through because we kind of always had that kind of captain guy that did that right from Roy Keane to the Mark Hughes to Steve Bruce we had those kind of leaders that kind of dragged the whole team through that's kind of progressed we don't have that anymore we have players that need someone around them to play well but then the players that they need to play well aren't there and then we have a really aging squad too that you know we have this weird discrepancy with age it's just a whole it's a whole entire mess but essentially we have to be very ruthless and say that that defense has been there since FC Basel needs to go right so there's I don't know that that whole back line. You could have a reason to get rid of everyone on that back line, right? They could all be replaced, and no one will complain. Even Victor Lindelof, who I've been a big fan of this season, has really stepped up and kind of shown that he has the ability, he has the potential to be a very good squad player, or or actually a really good te- a really good uh, first teamer, right? He's as good as um, Matip, who plays alongside Virgil Van Dijk, but. Matip needs a Virgil van Dijk, right? When you had Matip, when you had Matip and Lovren playing in defence for Liverpool, they conceded loads of mis- they conceded loads of silly goals because you know they're both of the same level, not married much. No, no one's a big leader there that's going to drag the team through. So you could replace the whole back line. If David De Gea gets a bit disillusioned with the club's direction, he could probably end up going. Then you're having to spend more money on a keeper because again, people say Sergio Ramos won the best. Uh, the best number two in the world, but you know that's because he only plays I don't know twenty two games a season. You know I mean the pressure's not really there as much as any other game. Then you have the midfield; it needs a lot of work. You know Matic, he's probably on the dying side. Um, McTominay's probably a really good squad player, but shouldn't be starting. Fred, we don't know his best position is. Massa probably needs to be able to move on and get get going. We need the winger. So many holes there, and then up front. There's a really big question marks about Rashford. Really, um, it, it, can he be relied on to really? score the amount of goals that we need i think not um can you rely on lukaku not really can you rely on martial not really so you'd probably be looking to buy a pia tech from ac milan an actual clinical number nine you could just, just scores goals all the time to kind of put pressure on those players because again i just think my other boy's been like that i remember when i heard the you hear things about players come out in interviews like phil jones coming out one time saying that ah oh, he thinks he's good enough to play and he was being quite arrogant about how you know what he thinks about his level of um, his standard of play, right? How good he is quality-wise. It's just like, you know, some of these players have been given false impression about how good they are from contract extensions, right? Year contract extensions and triggered and you're like, how is Smalling and Jones still at this club? It doesn't make any sense. And I'm glad to see that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is recognising this. There's an article here on Sky Sports that kind of spoke about it where he says, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer say, Manchester United rebuild could take years, which I'm happy. It's going to take more than a few years, my friend. Um, what do you say here? Let's play the video. But... <sighs> We're on with the job and uh, we've spoken to the players about it as well that we need to get the best out of each other, create an environment of uh, top, top, top uh, class attitude, world class attitude every exactly. single day. Exactly. Because uh, we've got good players and I know I've got good players to work with. And But as, as I've said at the moment, we've, uh, we, we've really, really done well to get to the quarters here. We've really done well to get in the challenge for top four exactly. but we have as I said I, I like to talk, <laughs> see who I'm talking to so we've um, got a rebuilding job but it's it build, it starts with the coaches with the players and then of course one or two additions to the squad will, will happen in the, in the summer you know, one or two. We need a lot more than that. We need a lot more than one or two. I'm, I'm concerned that's what I'm saying I'm concerned because I, I, I just think there's not enough um um, there's not enough. I, I, I guess what he said, written between lines, right? World class attitude in the training ground. I think that's needed because you remember when Ibrahimovic came to United, 
the big difference that you saw was that the players are just Pogba, some of the other shitty players that own that team, even like some white matter and stuff, the levels just stepped up a notch because that, um, it, the same happened with Cristiano Ronaldo when you arrived at training for Juventus. How many Juventus players did you hear come out and say, wow, we, we thought this guy was amazing from afar, but now up close, Cristiano Ronaldo is like the, op, the, you know, the supreme professional. He comes in, he does his work, he's fucking serious. He stays in late after training to get more work done. He doesn't take, he doesn't play no games when it comes to his football thing. And that raised the levels of everyone in the team. And I think in general, over the years, because we, because Chris Smalling has been captain so many times, he's played, he's the first name on the team sheet because he's only one fit. Phil Jones plays when he comes back because he's aggressive. Ashley Young has played at right back because there's essentially been no one except for the low when he came in. It was him and Damien playing, um, competing for the right back position and out of Damien and Ashley Young, even Ashley Young is fucking terrible. You're always going to pick Ashley Young. Um, left back Luke Shaw has been basically had a, a you know, his, his name's been on the first name in the team sheet because there is no other fullback. David De Gea, maybe the same sort of thing too. There's been no pressure on his place. Everywhere you look in the team, Pogba, the same thing. Um, he could literally say, you know, there's no need to drop him ever because there's no one in that team that's better than him or whatever, in um, regards to how he plays. Everyone in that team has played horrible, right? It's played fucking bizarrely horrible, but they've had no pressure behind them. So I like what I was going to say, Ole Gunnar is saying about the idea that we need more quality players in and around the team to raise a standard, especially every day in training. But I just get the feeling that we're only going to see two players come in and he's going to tr somehow justify it and then start playing all the other players. I think, because we're not two players away. We need more than two. We need essentially two centre-backs. If you're at, at a stretch, you'll tell me, okay, you, know, you can't get two, you have to have one. Fine, let's have one. But we need a new right-back. We need a new left-back, for sure. We need someone to compete because if Ashley Young's going and you've got Dalot, you need somebody else's experience to be pushing him too so he can play together. Or if you're going to push Dalot out, uh, out right wing, you still need another right back because actually he's going to go away in a year. Or what are you going to do? You know what I mean? You're going to promote some of the youth, but you still need another left back then to promote. Then you still need two or three. Then midfield, you need probably two or three too in that regard because, you know, Matic's going to probably go. You need somebody to challenge McTominay. You need a replacement for Matic. Then up front, you probably need two as well because Lukaku's not going to be happy playing on the bench. Rashford's probably not going to be someone you can rely on. And Martial's attitude swings around about. So you still need six players, regardless of how you cut it, five to six players minimum in that team, just to get us just to get us to be stable. And again, if those five, six players get injured, we're back on the same level again. It's like Man City, right? Like, they just replaced everyone. Like, you just need to replace all the players that you don't like with the players that you want. Simple as that, really. Um... But again, it just takes so much money to do this. And we've already spent, I don't know, I think someone um, someone said to me, I read somewhere, since Alex Ferguson retired, we spent 800 million. So we do spend money, but we spend it on such bullshit. Like we're, our, it's like, I don't know where the scouting is. Like we don't tend to buy with any sort of foresight. Like Fred was bought and I don't see any reason why he was bought. I get the Delo the, the, the low buy because, you know, you couldn't get Paris or you buy the low because he can whip good balls into the area for Lukaku. Cool. Why was Fred bought? No idea. He's a great. Don't worry. He's a good player. He's been improving over the recent weeks. But why was he bought? We don't know. We don't know. Anyway, next video from Oligano Solskjaer. We did well to get here, uh, and we uh, we could see the difference between the two teams tonight. Uh, the quality of their finishing was absolutely outstanding, oh. and uh, we started well, as you said. The first fifteen minutes, you thought uh, we've. We've got something here, and then in four minutes they scored two goals, which made it so hard. But the attitude was right. Second half, we got out there. We knew we were uh, fighting against a good team and some good players out there. So um, yeah, the, we know there's work to be done. We have have said, and we've said uh, all along that this isn't going to change overnight, and uh, the next few years are going to be uh, be massive for us to get to the level. Barcelona and those teams are at the moment. Uh, I think you surprised us and them with the expansive way you went about it. From the... <sighs> it's going to take a lot longer than that, mate. It's going to take a lot longer than that. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, man. That's it, man. But I don't know about the... In... And again, just look at the Paul Pogba thing. Like, I'm a big fan of his, but he definitely is. A... Again, we've always thought... We... You think players are something that they are, but they're not really a player that you think they are. Like, you know, you thought he was that... Like drag you through, drag you over the finishing line kind of dude, but he isn't. He just needs a good players around him. Every team he's played in where he's had good players is Sean. Juventus, France national team. That That's obvious. No, it's obviously the case. And he just needs good players around him. Without good players, he doesn't play well. That ball to Griezmann that he, that he did of, during the international break, that over the top ball, only happens because you have a Griezmann that makes those kind of intelligent runs. You know what I mean? He pulls up and you know he's going to bang it in, right? 
there's no point in popping that ball over the top for Lukaku because nine times out of ten he's probably gonna miss. Um, yeah. Right, what can you do, man? Is what is what it is. We got we got a long, long, long way to go. Um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping he's. Um, number one, we need a football director. Number two, we get Ed Woodward away from any sort of transfers. We need a really good scouting system. We need to have a plan in place for when it goes right with Oligon Social and if it goes wrong. We identify the players that we want, the players that fit his profile, that fit the club's profile. And if Oligon Social is able to get the best out of those players, we're moving on and get another manager in. But there's a plan in place. We don't go and do what we did with previous managers where we just give them money, let them buy their own players and then another manager comes in, they buy their own players. No, we have a style of play that we're trying to promote some players we want. It's kind of like utility players. We get them in, right? Some some specials, but utility players that every manager would basically want. And then we then um, frame that as our way of... that. That's kind of the players you have. Use your use those players to play this particular style of football. This is the coach. He coaches you. If you can't get the best results, you replace the coach, you get another one. Same like Barcelona, same as Ajax. Same as all the great clubs out there that are playing great football. You can replace the manager, but the players will probably be around the same profiles, right? They'll be the same. And they'll play this, probably play the same kind of football. For instance, if, if Klopp ever leaves Liverpool, I don't think they would ever go back to playing Rafa Benitez-style football ever again, right? They've already got, they've kind of got their DNA. So what they would look for is they'll go out there into the continent and look for managers that kind of match Klopp's profile. Because essentially, if they match Klopp's profile, they'll be able to get the best players, the best out of players already there. And they'll also be more agreeable to getting to having the players that the football director recommends. And that's what we need in Man United. We don't need Ole Gunnar Solskjaer to go in there with his own list. We need a list to be uh, something that represents United and what we're going to do going forward. Hopefully that happens. But again, United's been one of those kind of things. It's kind of run like the FA, isn't it? You think they're going to make the common sense this choice, but they end up always making the fucking stupid, um, ridiculous choice like, you know, signing Gareth Bell because he's good on social media. It's like, ugh, bloody hell, man. Anyway, moving on, 